गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू द रानम इवेंट ऑफ फिफ्थ फिफ्थ एलिफेंट बिग डेटा सो आई एम लड़ाट द मोहंती एम वॉकिंग लड़ाट इन क्लस्टर ऑफ एस आई गोइंग टॉक अबाउट क्लस्टर ऑफ एस ओवर वी एंड विथ हडू वी विजय वी विल हेल्प मी प्रिपेयरिंग द प्रेजेंटेशन ही एक्चुअली गिव दिस प्रेजेंटेशन इन लिनक्स कॉन 2013 सो आई हैव टेकन दिस प्रेजेंटेशन मॉडिफाइड टू ऐड सम हडू थिंग्स सो ही इज अ कोमेंटर ही इज टॉक इज द फ्रटर मी अबाउट सेफ So this is the agenda. Uh, obvious question: What is cluster of S? Overview about it. Then uh, use cases of cluster of S. Where you can use cluster of S. Um, then how do you find cluster of S? So what is cluster of S? A cluster of S is a scale-out solution, uh, open-source software uh, which can scale up to petabytes of data. Can connect to thousands of th- thousands of thousands of clients. Um, it actually ex- aggregates the storage from the network. From a storage pool, so like you have multiple servers, you have storage inside each of them. You can aggregate them, and it can represent just single global instances to just the part of single volume, so which you can use for storing your data, uh, big data analytics, whatever you want. So cluster is a file system completely user space. So it uses the uh, on disk file system. Uh, it it uh, relies on a disk file system, which supports external attributes. Uh, external attributes is kind of a uh, 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 feature in Linux file systems where you can associate properties to files. Like you have any on any on this file system, you have metadata associated to each file. When uh, uh, that's by default created on a disk file system. Let's say you want to attach some more information to the file or uh, metadata, uh, that you can do through external attributes. So cluster of these features uh, external attributes very extensively. Uh, So that is one of the reason why uh, we don't need a separate metadata server. Cluster uh, is a distributed file system. Uh, most of the distributed solutions offer, uh, you know, if you look into the solution, they have a metadata server which have have the information about the files. Like in HDF Hadoop file system, we have a name server which has uh, information about the files and block of data where it is exactly present. So in Cluster FS, we don't need that. Uh, one of the reason is we use extended attributes. If you have any question, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, feel uh, free to interrupt me in between. I'm glad to answer your questions. So this is a picture of a presentation of a typical uh, cluster of deploy- cluster of its deployment. Uh, you can see here this is the cluster uh, storage pool of cluster of its. Uh, these are servers. Uh, it's quite flexible in terms of what backend you guys use for your disk. You can use DAS or a JBoard, just a bunch of disks or a SAM, whatever you want. And these all servers actually, uh, uh, if you use cluster, this you can aggregate the storage from all the nodes and be present as a single volume uh, to the clients. So these are the protocols, the clients uh, we support: uh, NFS, SMB, um, SIPS, HTTP, FTP. And also, most of the security mount type that is fused file system in user space. So these are the protocols on which you can access a cluster of its volume. Cluster of its is a scalar solution, so it provides us uh, you know linear performance scaling. That means when you keep on adding multiple more nodes, the performance should actually increase rather you know decreasing. It should increase because you are adding more nodes to it. That's how scalar solution should work. So we'll talk about cluster of its architecture a little bit. Um, it's a software-only solution. It can run commodity hardware, uh, which is available like x86 or, uh, or Itanium, whatever uh, hardware available. You can uh, uh, use those hardware to run clusters on it. No external metadata servers. Uh, scale out with elasticity, extensible and modular, uh, unified access. Um, you can access uh, files through multiple protocols, like I mentioned. And this is a POSIX compliant file system. There is the advantage uh, we are getting with the POSIX compliant file system is you can access the client can access the files on cluster FS through a lot of uh, protocols: NFS, SMB, Fuse, HTTP. I will talk about uh, breakdown cluster FS to a couple of uh, components so that you can easily understand the concepts behind it. The first thing is uh, storage pool. So, like I said, cluster FS. Is a cluster as a distributed file system uh, where you need to you know have multiple nodes. If you can start, you can start with a single node, 
storage, your uh, storage needs grow, you can keep on adding nodes and it can actually get integer uh, file system size. So the pool of nodes called storage pool. Um, so, so to form a storage pool, you need to, uh, there is a concept of trusted storage pool. So there are a couple of nodes which are already present. If they want, you want to add a new node, so you have to do a invitation basically. This is called peer probe. So without invitation, it cannot come to the storage pool. So you have to do a peer probe to the new machine. And if the peer process is successful, then it's part of the storage unit. You can use its storage again through this process. So, uh, so membership information used uh, for determining quorum. So, uh, plus there are situations in distributed file system where because of some disaster, your couple of nodes goes down. So, there is a concept in restaurant, so you can create a quorum. You know, if you, let's say I have ten nodes, and if my five nodes are down. I don't want to operate because it will put the data at higher risk of data corruption. So that information, that kind of feature is there in Westerface and the number of node information what we have in storage pool is used to determine, I mean, I mean you can set a parameter and there are other things, you can set a quorum whether in Westerface pool you want to be in operational mode or not. Any questions till now? Uh, the other uh, concept is bricks. So brick is where actually uh, the data uh, actually resides. Um, so when uh, you know when you create a volume, you need to mention the bricks, which bricks it should use. I mean, where the exactly the data is present or would be present in when uh, I mean in different servers. So it consists of the server name and the partition or the on disk file system what you want to export. You want to use for clusterfs to so basically aggregate. There is no limit on uh, how many bricks you can use per load. Uh, you can, uh, the brick can reach the limits of underlying file system. Like I already said, it needs an on-disk file system. So when you're using a brick and which have on-disk file system, so it uh, it has it can reach the limits of the underlying file system. Let's say you know if one file system does not support a uh, certain amount of size of data, so obviously when you write the data to cluster and finally goes to a disk. So it, if the limit is not there, it will fail. So you need to be aware of the limitation of the underlying file system. Ideally, we recommend each brick in cluster should be of same size because the files are totally distributed to get a better utilization. Uh, if it is the same size, it's definitely better. Here is the example you can see. There are three storage nodes, and uh, the first this one has three bricks. And um, this one is five bricks, and this one again have three bricks. Any questions? Um, this is a cluster. I'm talking about cluster volumes now. Um, volume is a logical collection of bricks. The bricks that I saw in the previous picture, you can have a logical collection of bricks to actually represent a single namespace, a single volume. And you can mount a volume on the client to the protocols I mentioned, NFS, SMB, and fuse file system in user space. The simple syntax given uh, where you have to mention the volume name and the server name on one of the pool from server from the storage pool. Uh, a single brick uh, from the same node can be part of different volumes. Uh, what you can do is if you have a brick, you can create subdirectories inside the brick. And use each of the separate for actually part of different volumes. This is an example. I um, have three nodes here, node one, node two, node three, and you can see this export slash exports are the actually um, partitions which I'm going to use for cluster FS. And uh, there are different subdivisions like brick one. Uh, all brick one subdivisions is part of a volume which is really so much music. All brick two subdivisions are part of uh, volume. Stored videos that can be done. The different kind of volumes in the surface. Um, so depending on the volume, so we have a couple of algorithms in the surface so where depending on the volume time, it, uh, it actually decides how to distribute the data across the nodes, where to store, how to store. So these are the volume types. One is distributed stripe replication. And these are mixed up for the top three distributed replicate, stripe replicate, 
uh, distribution type of So each of them, like distribute has its own advantage and disadvantage. Replication is the only central advantage. So we can you know combine them and get the best out of the lot, basically, depending on your requirement. Uh, distributed volume. So distributed volume is a simple, is a very simple way to go. Exactly, it actually distributes the files across all the bricks. So let's say I have, I have two nodes, and each node I have a single brick. Uh, these are the two nodes, so server 1 and server 2. I have two bricks like ex, uh, export 1 and export 2. I, I am writing three files. So it will distribute the three files across two nodes. And uh, here it actually putting two uh, files and here it's putting a single file. So the question now comes how it decides which file to put where. So it uses a hash algorithm. Um, and uh, in, from the file name it, it creates the hash. And the bricks also, you know, when you create a volume, it assigns the hash range to each of the bricks. So when it generates a file, when you're writing a file, on the fly it generates a hash, a hash value out of it, and it decides this, where this hash value actually should be, because already the bricks has a hash range. Like you know, let's say in a simple word, let's say it divides into 0 to 50, 50 to 100, and the file hash comes as 51, and it thinks around the 51 should be between 50 and 100, so it will put in brick two. So that's how it decides on the fly how where to put the uh, file. So we don't have any uh, replication here or something. So if one bit goes down, you won't be finding the file. So it's a data loss. Um, but because of the hashing mechanism we have, it's definitely useful. Uh, we don't need a metadata server because the same hash range also you know, we, we store the information, the external attributes in the file. So when a client requests any information. It checks the action attributes, first of all, checks the action attributes where the file is and directly goes and fetches the file. We don't need a separate metadata server where we need information about which file resides where. So, the hash algorithm I was talking about is called Davis Mayer hash algorithm. Um, so, a 32 bit hash is divided into uh, number of bricks you have and also directories because. Uh, so when you create a directory, the layout should be present in each of the brick because let's say there is a directory, directory 1, you created two files, one file go to one brick, other file goes to other brick, so the directory has to be present everywhere. So it, when you create a directory, it basically creates the directory in all of the bricks, but when you create a file, it places the file according to its hash range. Any questions on this? So, uh, there is also a volume type called replicated volume. Uh, replicated volume is uh, it's a synchronous replication of all directory and files. Uh, in this basically, when you create a replicated volume and you have two bricks, that means they are like each brick is mirror of each other. It's a synchronous replication. So, whenever you write data, the data gets written into two, get written into two, two of the bricks simultaneously. And if at all, because of some uh, failure condition, one brick goes down, it can actually handle the request through the other brick. And when the one brick comes up, it automatically heals it. It's called self-healing in the SFS. It can automatically heal it, and, you know, similar uh, to HDFS, where HDFS also uh, actually, if something goes down and comes back, it also, you know, replicates the old, uh, new data to it. Any number of replicas can be configured in the SFS when you create a volume. So, so basically each of the operation inside uh, replication uh, uh, functionality in cluster phase, each of the operation are transition driven just to maintain consistency that everything operates perfectly, uh, data consistency is maintained. Also it, is, it maintains its own chain log of files so that it can know which field, where to replicate, how to make them you know, consistent. This is a picture representation of replicated volume. Uh, we have two uh, two bricks here, and uh, they are part of the replica pair. So whatever file you create, basically it will go to both of the places. So any file you create at the mount point, it goes to both of the places. So now we uh, learned about distributed uh, volume type and replicate volume type. So actually we can both. Uh, I mean, you can combine them both and I don't guess the best out of it. 
So replication is definitely helpful when you need uh, redundancy, redundancy of data in case of any failures. And distributed is helpful because it gives you more uh, in right performance. So uh, you know we can combine them both and also get benefit out of it. So now when you do distribute replicate volume, so uh, into the picture. So here we have uh, four servers. Each server is a single each brick uh, in it. So we have created we have created here uh, replicate two. So basically, I need uh, you know uh, one brick is so we have one replica. So here there are two pairs. This, this exp1, exp2 is a part of a uh, replica group. These two are part of the replica group. So when you write a, a file, so now it decides on the hashing uh, algorithm which group it should go. So let's say it decides this file one should go to this group. So file one comes to this group and it actually gets replicated on the two, two of the bricks. So when this brick is down, actually client can still uh, access the file one and uh, write it to whatever they want because one copy would be still available. And this replica count is uh, depends on uh, on the volumization command. You can do multiple replica count. Like here it is two, you can do three, four, whatever you want. If you want to maintain multiple uh, redundancy levels. Uh, we have another type of volume called stripe volume where files are actually get striped into different uh, bricks. It's so only recommended where you know you have a uh, file size which is bigger than any brick size. Let's say you have two bricks, each of one TB, and uh, you are actually writing a two TB file. So obviously the two TB file is cannot uh, reside in the single brick because it's bigger than each brick, right? So you can use stripe and uh, basically you split the file into two parts and store it in each brick. Um, a brick failure can result to data loss because we don't have a replica. So we have a redundant copy, so one node goes down. So obviously, this data loss. So it's always recommended to use with it, uh, replicated volume, stack replicated, so that you have a redundant copy of the data. So we can now uh, basically the added brick, added addition of brick, removal of bricks, replacing any failed brick. These are all uh, you can do dynamically uh, runtime. Um, Basically, so whenever you feel like without affecting the application, without taking the volume offline. So the volume would be online, you can do all these op operations like uh, addition of brick and uh, uh, remove brick. So rebalance, rebalance something which we need in case of distributed volume. Let's say you have 10 nodes, 10 bricks and you have a lot of data. Now you actually added 4-5 more nodes because you need more storage space now. So you want to increase your storage. So when you add new five nodes, when you create new data, it will be present on all the nodes. But what about the existing bricks, which are almost like 70% full, right? Now you want to evenly spread all the data across all the nodes. So what do you do? You do a rebalance. So rebalance actually will distribute the data across all the nodes. Basically, you measure it with better inflation and you won't face a single brick will go out of space rather now as a whole of uh, cluster. And you can do performance. Functionality, functionality tuning during runtime without affecting the application. No, cluster FS can handle itself. Let's say you have a replicated volume, right? And one of your brick actually fell because of power failure or something else. So now that you have a replica pair, application won't be affected anyway because you have a replica, replica pair which can handle the request coming from the client. So now when you fix it, let's say there is a power issue, there is a uh, you know, you have power outage, now the power comes back, the server again boots up. So again it, it will automatically uh, understand that this file is actually, for, this uh, brick was offline for some time because it maintains its own change log. And I need to you know heal it, fix it basically. So the cluster is automatically start fixing it. So recovery mechanism is also taken care of. Yeah. So does that type of say is there a master node or something which takes care of some because that we are in two hours? no. So that is uh, one of the benefit, right? We don't have a uh, I mean it's like a distributed uh, thing. So uh, it's not master node but the replica, other replica pair I think takes care of it. Take care of. Yeah. So it's all between the yeah, yeah, single. So the, the programmer who is doing a writing a 
Right. Right. You you need to respond in some way that you know you need to fix it anyway. Oh. Because let's say you have a two-way replication and one bit goes down. Now what about the other bit goes down? <laughs> so so here you have to take care of it. But yeah, not like you don't have to take the application offline. Okay. Right. So some API will. I can see the response. Yeah, you can see the logs and also there is CLI commands where you can see the status of heal, what is, if any heal, healing is going on, right? Self healing is going on, uh, where to where is happening, or that kind of information. This is the access, me access mechanisms for cluster service volumes. Um, fuse based native protocol, uh, file system in user space. You can mount a cluster service volume through, uh, volume through fuse protocol. Uh, NFS V3 and uh, NFS V4 are getting it from uh, Ganesha, right? NFS Ganesha project. Uh, SMB, uh, LibGV API is a uh, Rust Rust API which can directly, as a C uh, library written in C, a uh, programming language, it will directly talk to Rust Rust so you can develop application directly with it. It's mostly used for our integration points with different projects. Um, REST API, uh, HTTP, and HDFS. The most important part in Rust Rust implementation is translator. Uh, it is inspired from uh, basically uh, new hard project where they have translators where each translator is a functional unit and uh, it is stackable. There, uh, they can be run then uh, added to the stack and removed. So uh, Rust Rust also have uh, translators. So all you have seen the distributed file, distributed functionality or replicated functionality. These so are all uh, actually implemented as a translator. So it's very easy for, for to you know uh, change the translator stack to include any functionality during runtime. So this is how it looks. Like, I mean, if you do a picture representation of a translator stack, this is how it looks. Translator can be on the client side stack or can be on the server side. So this blue, what you see, is the client side. This is the client, and this is the server actually. This is the disk where actually data is getting written. And this is cluster test. So it starts from there. You have translators to do a lot of performance things, uh, performance tuning, and uh, stuff like that. And it finally comes to the days. It comes to the server. The server also have translators, and it comes to the days. And finally, this is the project layer where you write to, to talk to the underlying file system on the disk. Any question on this? So currently, uh, Clusterface is already integrated with a lot of projects like OpenStack, um, Samba, NFS Ganesha, Overt for management of uh, the GUI management for Clusterface and other projects, uh, KMU, uh, Hadoop, and other, other things also. This is how uh, finally put together all the things for Clusterface. So, this is uh, the recommended. Uh, Things uh, for the stuff is when you have hard disk and you have hardware it, then on top of it you do uh, LVM and now you can actually support thin provisioning, thin P volumes. Uh, then you do uh, any uh, file system which sub uh, I mean supports external attributes, which can be H2, H3, 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 H3
built in cloud when you have multiple devices you want to sync the data synchronously across multiple you started something going on mobile and want to continue on a tablet the storage so we can follow up on that uh, big data semi structured and structured data this is uh, mostly i'm talking about i think mongo db is uh, one example um xml data emails json uh, json format data is Um, so yeah, now we are talking about Hadoop and cluster space. So now there is big data conference, and you know Hadoop is a very important part of big data, where you can do a lot of analytics using Hadoop on large set of data. So we are capable uh, at Hadoop. Basically, you just map reduce. Hadoop has a lot of programming models. One of them are map reduce. So you can map, you can use map reduce on Hadoop to do um, process a lot of lot lot, lot uh, large set of data and uh, do analytics on it. So we support. Uh, Hadoop on Rustrface, so it can it can run MapReduce jobs on Rustrface volumes. So for that we have a plugin called uh, Rustrface Hadoop plugin, uh, which, which replaces the HDFS and uh, you know, Rustrface use in place of HDFS. So this is the GitHub page. Uh, the details about this plugin, I mean how to use it, are there in the GitHub page. I don't know. Show you a little bit about it. So the readme file and it has all the requirements and if you want to create, it uses Maven to create the jar file of the plugin. So you can look into it. So if you want to use cluster based in place of Hadoop. So uh, now the obvious question comes right. If I all uh, Hadoop already has HDFS, um, Hadoop file system. So who, why why do you use cluster FS? I mean, or some other open source storage for it. Advantage first advantage is advantage of having a persistent compliant file system. HDFS is not a persistent compliant file system, so you cannot access through NFS or you know uh, SMB or Fuse or some other protocol, uh, but which is uh, pretty uh, useful. Um, and you can basically rest of the supports like I already talked about a lot of protocols, so you can use those protocols to access the data on those volumes. The other advantage is having a single storage for map reduce and storing your data. So let's say you have a Apache web server and you are getting lot of lot of log files. You want to analyze it, so you need to again upload it to HDFS uh, file system so that map reduce jobs can be run on it. But if you use cluster kind of a solution where you can actually use cluster FS to store those log files and use the, those to again run map reduce jobs, so you don't have to. The time is basically saved, and also you don't have to manage two different things. One is DFS and one separate storage. So, a unified storage can be used for both of your purposes, right? So, this is the biggest one of the biggest advantage, I would say. Um, in HDFS architecture, there are two kind of nodes. One is name node, one is data node. So, data node is where the tasks actually get run, and the name node is where uh, where the metadata is stored. So, whenever they want to run a job, they go to name node and find out wherever the block is present and try to run the job there. So in the cluster FS, we don't need a name, a name node. So basically, uh, uh, if the architecture is like that, it can it can it, it works fine without a name node. So that way, you can save a lot of hardware and management stuff. There are a lot of advantages. Uh, this one I was talking about uh, the Jira application eraser coding. The Jira application is uh, used for disaster recovery. It's a uh, Asynchronous incremental replication service. It can actually replicate data from one side to other, uh, other through local area network or WAN or through internet. So it's pretty healthy. The other is eraser coding. Um, eraser coding is another way of uh, getting data redundancy and fault tolerance. It's actually, you can uh, I can it, it would be similar to a ready, uh, software implementation of a RAID redundant number and independent list. So it's actually reduced to that way. So map reduce jobs uh, in the HDFS use something called local uh, data locality optimization. It's first it get the information where the data is present and try to run the job there so that it saves the network bandwidth um, and obviously it result better performance. So in cluster office, actually we cluster office uh, plugin is already takes care of that. Because in each file, we actually store where the file is present. So, plugin text finds where the file is stored, 
and the MapReduce reduce jobs actually run there. So it's actually same thing as HDFS. Data locality optimization is present in MustFS. I think this is not present on Amazon S3 or something if you do. That's why yesterday I've run uh, it. I've been it The two prominent uh, Apache projects present, one is Apache Spark and other is Apache Apari and both works with MustFS. I'm going to talk about it and about this. The Apache Spark project is uh, another uh, open source data analytics cluster computing network. So it's basically is a programming model like MapReduce. So it uh, replaces MapReduce uh, in Hadoop. It works with Hadoop, so you can use Hadoop and use Spark to run, do the analytics. It mostly oriented to in uh, oriented towards uh, to do analytics on a um, in memory basically data. So it gets data into in memory and runs on it. So because of that, it's very faster. So it claims up to be 100 times faster than Hadoop in certain applications like data mining. So you can read about it more about uh, in the link. So the other project, Apache Ambari project, which is uh, an automation project for provisioning, uh, managing and monitoring Apache Hadoop clusters. So you can use this particular project for uh, doing uh, all this stuff with ClusterFS. Um, it's pretty easy to use. So it has all other peripheral projects like um, I think Nagios also you can uh, install and configure with it. Uh, so it's pretty helpful. So this is a pictorial representation of cluster uh, with Hadoop. Uh, this is a cluster with volume and you can see the other protocols like NFS, Fuse and Swift. Can access the of this volume and the same so three servers here, server one, server uh, not three, actually, 50 servers, which is so uh, we have a lot of servers here and each server has built, it can also uh, you know it can run the task, hard uh, task, and uh, it's also like is it brief. So a lot of things consolidated together so it will result to better utilization of hardware in CPU. Resources for cluster uh, if you have any queries, whether it's cluster you just use the spelling list. Uh, you can go to cluster.org, uh, you have links for this spelling list. You can, uh, if you have any questions regarding this, you can ask questions. You can ask the channel um, on free load. Also, it's pretty active and you can ask any questions you have. Thanks. So, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs>